All right, rejoining us on the channel is retired Navy Captain Kevin Hoser Miller, Hornet driver, LSO extraordinaire. You guys remember Hoser. He's been on the channel a number of times and was just my partner down at the NAS Oceana Air Show. He is the author of a historical fiction about the Battle of Midway called The Silver Waterfall. So if you haven't read that one, check it out. And we did a companion episode about the Battle of Midway last summer titled Everything You Didn't Know About the Battle of Midway. So now we're going to do a similar look, except at a different battle, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So, Hoser, great to have you back on the channel. Hi, Moose. Thanks so much for having me. So let's set the scene about the Battle of Leyte Gulf. What was going on strategically around the battle that sort of laid the framework for what we're going to talk about? Leyte Gulf was uh, the next large... Of fleet action after the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And this was in June of 1944. This is the famous Marianas turkey shoot, the mission beyond darkness, uh, where the, the Americans were able to capture Saipan and Tinian and Guam, the Mariana Islands. Uh, it was really Japan's uh, carrier air arms last gasp. They lost 90% of their airplanes uh, in, in this battle. So they, they had really nothing left. They had some carriers left, but uh, all their experienced pilots are now gone, and, and they really just, just don't, don't have the force that they had, uh, certainly at the beginning of the war when they changed the world with it. So now the Americans have to decide, okay, what's next? And there, there's, uh, there's competing ideas. Uh, one is Formosa. Today is Taiwan. Uh, let's, let's go to Taiwan, Formosa. Uh, we have our, our friends, the uh, nationalist Chinese, you know, but, but what we could really do is cut off the Japanese uh, lines of communication from Japan to, to Borneo, the Philippines, where they have a stronghold and, and down in Singapore, all those natural resources are getting cut that off. And then we'll have a, a, a jumping off point to the, uh, to the invasion of Japan. Uh, another school of thought, and this is from General Douglas MacArthur, imagine that. No, 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 the Philippines. We got to go to the Philippines because MacArthur famously said, I shall return. MacArthur wanted to command a great amphibious landing in the Philippines that, that, that he knew. And uh, so that, that was what, what he wanted. And, and uh, you know, the, the case that Admiral Nimitz and the Navy was making for Formosa, um, you know, he, he didn't want to hear any of that. He, uh, he pled his case to President Roosevelt. And said, Mr. President, how can you abandon one million Filipino Catholics to the Japanese this way? And, uh, you know, the presidential election in 1944, which by historic accounts was a dirty presidential election. I mean, so, so nothing's new. I mean, they're all dirty. And, uh, you know, so we didn't start the fire. You know, it was, it was going on. So, uh, so Roosevelt said, okay, let's go to the Philippines. I'll, I'll kind of stop here for a moment. Japanese uh, fighter pilot, Lieutenant Saburo Sakai. And, uh, and he, was, he is a famous one-eyed fighter pilot. And uh, you know, he lost one of his eyes in the, in the uh, actions in the South Pacific. And so the doctors were able to save one. He was on Iwo Jima now after the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And the Americans came to Iwo Jima and they, they uh, attacked it with carrier airplanes and, and shelled it over a period of several days. And, and he felt, okay, we are just, we have nothing here. They've, they've destroyed all of our airplanes on the runway. We, we, we have no way to resist. If they landed now, we, we've got nothing. But the Americans did not take that tack. And that gave the Japanese another eight months to fortify Iwo Jima, which we know they did in February, 1945, and we went back there. So we're, we're kind of, you know, Formosa, the Philippines, and then the American carrier forces start attacking targets in the Philippines, and, it, and it's pretty easy. And so it just seemed like within a, a, a couple of days or, or weeks of, yeah, let's just go to the Philippines. And so we did. And uh, our forces were landed there uh, in the middle of October 1944 at a place called Leyte Gulf, so an amphibious landing. Now, the famous battle, the Japanese knew that the Americans were, were heading to the Philippines and they had to hold it. The Japanese had an understanding of American presidential politics too. And they felt that if we are able to cause enough carnage and bloodshed, Roosevelt will be voted out of office in November and, and the Americans will, will sue for peace. 
And now, no, the United States was not going to do that. No matter who was president in 1945, we were still going to take the fight to Japan. They, so they were wrong on that. But, uh, but again, you know, an enemy, you know, thinking about uh, the American political structure. So how did the command of the Pacific divide between MacArthur and Nimitz? Yes, uh, MacArthur is uh, the supreme commander in charge of the invasion of the Philippines. And uh, so, so all of those amphibious forces, and he has a naval component commanded by uh, Admiral Thomas Kincaid, the commander of the Seventh Fleet. Kincaid's component uh, consists of the old you know, World War I battleships, and these are ships like West Virginia and California and Pennsylvania, you know, pulled up from the, from the muck and mire of Pearl Harbor, and they've been, they've been uh, renovated, and so now they're, they're on the line. But they're, they're not fast battleships, ships like Iowa and New Jersey. Uh, so he's got those. He's got uh, cruisers and destroyers. He has a bunch of light carriers and a bunch of escort or jeep carriers. His light carriers are providing some defense. Um, the jeep carriers are really flying closer sport missions for the amphibious invasion. They they are not designed to uh, to take on any any fleet units. Um, the air groups consist of FM2, you know, license built Wildcats. And, uh, and TBF, TBM Avengers. That's that's all that they are carrying. So so it's kind of you know meat and potatoes, uh, flying for those guys. Uh, the, the battleships are there, commanded by Admiral Jesse Oldendorf. Should the Japanese show up, so that is MacArthur's Navy. Nimitz and his commander is Admiral William Halsey, commander of the Third Fleet. And Halsey has the fast carriers, the Essex class carriers, and he's got like a dozen of them. And uh, fast battleships like Iowa, New Jersey. New Jersey was his flagship. And uh, South Dakota, Massachusetts, uh, all, all of those guys. USS Alabama. Um, cruisers and destroyers and just the greatest Navy that the world has ever seen, really. And as far as, uh, as, far as firepower at, at, at the time. Now, those two tectonic plates of control. They kind of grind together in the middle of this thousand mile battlefield at a place called San Bernardino Strait. So we've got the tectonic plates that we'll deep dive on in a second, but how did this battle start? Uh, the Japanese plan was to have a three-prong attack to the north off uh, Luzon. Uh, Vice Admiral Ozawa would have his four aircraft carriers, and they had some airplanes on them, but but uh, inexperienced pilots, and uh, they, they weren't really a, a fighting force. They were the bait to draw the Americans north, away from Leyte Gulf, about 500 miles away. Then a pincer attack, two uh, surface uh, uh, groups would come up. The first one would come through uh, the uh, Surigao Strait, and, uh, and this is a couple of battleships and cruisers and destroyers, and they would go right at the American uh, uh, landing beaches at Leyte Gulf. The other force, commanded by Admiral Corita, was going to go up along the Palawan Passage and then get into the Savoyan Sea and come through San Bernardino Strait. So this would be you know, the, 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 the pincer attack happening at, at pretty much the same time. On October 23rd, on the Palawan Passage, Submarines Darter and Dace were able to uh, to, to uh, sink and damage uh, Japanese ships in Karita's force, and to include Karita's flagship that was sunk out from under him. So he's in the water, he's fished out of the water, and he goes to the super battleship Yamato to, uh, to continue command of the center force. On October 24th, though, those ships are in the Savoyan Sea, and Halsey's pilots met them and just savaged them throughout the day, especially the super battleship Musashi, Yamato's uh, sister. Musashi absorbed 20 torpedoes and 17 bombs in five separate attacks throughout the day. And other Japanese ships, including Yamato and other, other ships, were, were taking punishment. Musashi amazingly floated for another five hours after the last attack before she finally uh, capsized. But the Japanese continued on that moonlit night, on the night of the 24th, they continued on toward the San Bernardino Strait. Meanwhile, uh, the, the southern uh, Japanese force is entering uh, the, the, the Sugaro Strait, and it is met by Admiral Jesse Oldendorf and his uh, six older battleships, which are quite capable, got a lot of fight in them. Uh, PT boats and torpedo attacks, 
then destroyers with torpedoes, finally cruisers, and then the battleship broadsides. The two Japanese battleships were sunk, and, and most of the ships were, uh, were annihilated in that battle. There might have been one destroyer that lived to tell the tale. It, uh, so that force is wiped out. Admiral Kurita, though, in the Savoyan Sea that night, the night of the 24th, he, you know, he has no contact with the group to the south. He doesn't know what they're doing. They, they, they could be annihilated or, or maybe they're, they're still there. He doesn't know, but he continues on through the San Bernardino Strait. So now I'm going to bring it to dawn on October 25th, 1944. Halsey has detected the, uh, the, the Japanese force to the north. And so he says, OK, I'm, th this is it. Four carriers, you know, we, we can end the war today by putting those four on the bottom and, and I'm, I'm going to be there to, to command my forces. And, you know, it, 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 you know we, now we're talking about, you know, uh, unity of command, economy of force. You don't want to, you know, break up your forces. But he also knows that the Carita's force from the 24th that he had savaged on the 24th, yeah, it's still there, but, but he and his pilots didn't think it was worth much now because they had been beaten up so bad. So it's probably not, not much to deal with. But he had told Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Kincaid that he was going to form Task Force 34 that would guard San Bernardino Strait. And this would consist of, you know, you know a couple battleships and uh, cruisers and, and escorting forces and take the rest of his force north to get the carriers because he had found them. Here I'm going to, uh, you know, talk about, you know, some of the uh, uh, memories of uh, Lieutenant Ed DeJardy. And Ed DeJardy was the officer of the deck aboard the destroyer USS Johnston, part of Tappy 3 there north of uh, Samar. I, I did not know this. I wasn't smart enough to know this when I was on active duty, but I went to a, a leadership school in Newport, Rhode Island in the summer of 97. And, uh, and he was invited at the end of the course to come in and say, okay, this is the off to the deck aboard USS Johnson. Now, I knew enough about the battle to uh, say, I, I want to see this. You know, he was in his mid-70s at the time and, uh, you know, balding, you know, big Mr. Magoo glasses and, and uh, you know, diminutive man. And, and he told us uh, what it was like there. So, so that night, they are listening to the, the, the booms from the south. And this is, you know, the Americans that are just savaging the Japanese that are coming up that the Americans have crossed the Japanese T and, and they're just putting them on the bottom. So they're hearing all this. They can see the flashes to the south in Surigao Strait and they're thinking, wow, we've missed it. You know, this this is the big one and those guys are getting all the gory and we're just babysitting these Jeep flat tops out here in the middle of nowhere and doing not much of anything. Uh, that morning at dawn, a uh, uh, an Avenger on a, on a patrol sees this Japanese column and he's saying, look, these, you know, I'm seeing Japanese ships and they're saying, hey, you know, you know, you know, try to identify, you know, what you're seeing. He says, look, I'm seeing the biggest battleship I've ever seen <laughs> coming at us. Then on the horizon, the Americans can see the pagoda masts and the, the, the ships are hull down. They see these masts and then they can tell that the, the Japanese are firing at them. The, the Japanese see them too. And so, again, these are, you know, Yamato with 18 inch naval rifles. I mean, you know, one of these shells weighed 3,100 pounds. It was, uh, it was, you know, well over six feet tall, you know, you know, you stand it on end there and can be fired, you know, over 20 miles. And, and there's other battleships with, uh, with 14 inch guns and, uh, and there's cruisers and destroyers all over the place. So here come the Japanese and they're going against Taffy three, which is six escort carriers and roughly six or eight escorting destroyers and destroyer escorts. And again, the American forces were never, ever designed. I mean, the, the, the carriers are merchant hulls. The destroyers have, you know, three eighths inch steel hull plates. And you, you're never designed to go against even the cruiser, much less, you know, multiple uh, cruisers and, and battleships here. USS Johnston, uh, commanded by Captain Ernest Evans. Now, Captain Evans, uh, Naval Academy graduate. Uh, he was from uh, South Dakota, I, I believe, a, a, a full-blooded Sioux Indian, I believe, the, the Sioux tribe. The crew called him the chief, and, and it was not a derisive term. They, they, they respected him. 
Evans had been uh, aboard, uh, uh, he had been the president at the Battle of the Java Sea in 1942, which was uh, a disaster for the American forces early in the war. And uh, so he was given command of Johnston and he told the crew, we are going in harm's way. So get ready. We're, we're going to take it, it right to them. So that's the kind of ship Johnston was, you know, led by Commander Ernest Evans. The, the Japanese appear. And again, what the Americans should do is run for their lives. And the carriers do that. And it's, and it's fine that they did. I mean, all the pilots are rousted out of bed. You know, pilots man your planes and they're just, they're just getting them in there. And whatever they got, they're just launching them to do something. The destroyers, uh, led by Johnston, charge the enemy. Now here, I want to remind uh, your, uh, again, your, your knowledgeable audience uh, that uh, October 25th is, uh, is an important day in military history. It is the anniversary of the Battle of Balaklava and Norbaklava in, uh, in the Crimean War in 1854. And uh, this was uh, immortalized in the poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, the uh, and, uh, you know, oh, oh, the, oh, the charge they made, when will their glory fade? The world wondered. Just sorry for butchering that as I did. It's also the anniversary of the Battle of Augencourt, which was made famous in, uh, in, uh, in Shakespeare's Henry VIII. You know, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, probably the, the greatest, you know, pregame uh, military speech ever. So th this, this is what's happening on this day, October 25th in military history. Johnston charges the enemy along with the destroyer Herman and the destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts. And uh, Johnston and the other destroyers, they have five five-inch guns and they've got uh, torpedo tubes and, and small arms and, and that's all they have. Uh, and the, the Samuel B. Roberts, I think, had, had uh, three five-inch guns and, and torpedoes and that was it. The Americans charge at them. The Japanese are now firing and, uh, you know, Evans would, you know, on, on his nose, a gigantic shell would erupt out of the water and he'd, he'd have his, uh, his the deck watch crew uh, steer, for, steer for that splash and then steer for the next one. And uh, Ed Jajardi talked about this, that uh, you could see the, the Japanese broadside. And if you, if you were looking at through glasses, you could see the, the shells, you know, coming up and they're coming at you. In 20 seconds, they're going to be on you. And it, it was silent that whole time until they got there. And then he said it was like a freight train. And then just, you know, massive, massive shells. Johnston is in a position to uh, launch her, uh, her uh, torpedoes. She's firing her five inch guns and out of range, by the way. But uh, Johnston shoots her uh, torpedoes. She is able to launch them and gets a hit on a Japanese cruiser and blows his bow off. But Johnston is taking punishment uh, again from Ed DeJardy. Uh, Captain Evans, uh, there, there's a, a shell that hit the ship. And, and just the force of the shell blew open his khaki shirt. It, that this button, the khaki shirt, just blew it open. Another officer was blown out of his shoes that remained on the deck neatly tied. Johnson is now taking hits. Uh, these are armor-piercing shells coming from the Japanese that are going through the ship like a hot knife through butter. They are not even arming because, you know, that 3 8 inch steel is not enough to, to register that it's hit anything and going right through the ship, although it is killing uh, the human bodies that, that are that are there and, and of course all the machinery in the ship. Johnston is making smoke and uh, again from Ed DeJardy, you know, Evans saying, I want smoke, you know, and so this is the white smoke that, uh, that you know, like a decoy smoke, but also they're putting, you know, you know, you know, not much air in the fuel mixture and making just a black smoke is coming out of the funnel and, and, and that's what he wants. All this is going on. Johnston is able to launch her torpedoes, and so does Samuel B. Roberts and, and Hull and, and Herman. Johnson now has lost an engine and goes into a squall. And so there's kind of a reprieve. I mean, she has dozens of her crew are dead. No engine, she's out of torpedoes, all has five inch guns left. And uh, against the, these Japanese heavy forces, right there is a Navy cross action. And Evan says, we're going back, and and Johnston did, and and along with uh, with Hole and and uh, Samuel B. Roberts, they uh, they continued fighting the Japanese as the carriers are fleeing to the south, and then eventually the southwest. The Japanese are going around them, and and uh, 
doing quite good work. They, uh, they had found the carrier Gambier Bay and, uh, and then poured fire into her and, uh, and eventually sank her. The first uh, carrier uh, you know, sunk by, uh, by, by naval gunfire. At this point, the, uh, um, the Americans are, are in big, big trouble. And uh, Admiral Kincaid is hearing all of this and he needs help. So he is calling for Admiral Halsey to help him. I need help here at San Bernardino Strait. And then Halsey's like, hey, look, keep your shirt on, Tom. I mean, I've got, I've got the big Japanese fleet up here to the north. So you, you, you'll be okay. You've got forces. Here we go to Makalapa Hill. And this is where Admiral Nimitz is watching this action. And Admiral Nimitz is uh, he's looking at his uh, chief of staff, Sock Morris. You know they're, they're reading the message traffic, and and he's like, "What is going on? Where is Task Force Thirty Four that Bill said he would form?" And so Morris says, "Sir, why don't you ask him?" And this mooch brings us to the most famous naval message in history. So Admiral Nimitz is now asking Admiral Halsey. Where is Task Force 34? See, Nimitz is a, was a good commander and is reticent to, as we say, reach into the cockpit. You know, Halsey is fighting his battle out there and Nimitz doesn't want to, to meddle, but he feels he has to. Sometimes commanders have to reach in and say, okay, what, what, what's going on? He didn't want to necessarily know where Task Force 34 was, but where should it be? Because you said, Bill, that you were going to form it around San Bernardino Strait, and it doesn't appear to be there. There's something going on around there, and so, so where are they? All right, so now we, we go to, you know, the game that we used to play in, in, uh, in fourth grade, you, you know, get all the students in, 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 a, in a group, and, a, and then, you know, you whisper something to your neighbor next to you, and then they whisper that, they whisper that, and it kind of goes all the way around the class, and it comes back something completely different. So that was, that was kind of what's happening here. So where is Task Force 34? That is the message. The radio guys get this and they say, wow, this looks pretty serious. We should add it to it. We should say, where is, repeat, where is Task Force 34? That's not what Nimitz wanted, but the radio guys did that. And now we get into how naval messages are sent and and, uh, obviously a a flash message. And there's going to be padding which is nonsense words on, on the front of the message and on the back of the message. Admiral Halsey now is aboard the uh, flag bridge of USS New Jersey, and uh, he is going to uh, receive this message. The guys in New Jersey in the, in the radio shack get it, and they say, this is pretty hot. We better give it right to the old man right now. So they don't take the padding off, and they're going to just send it right to him. And so he's up on the flag bridge, you know, you know, maybe drink a cup of coffee. Hey, sir, this is, this is important. Better read it. So this is what he reads. Turkey trots to water, which is nonsense padding that four stars are not used to reading, from Sinkpack, that's Nimitz. Action, Com Third Fleet, that's Halsey. Info, Commander-in-Chief, and that's Admiral King, essentially the Chief of Naval Operations of the day, who's monitoring the action in Washington, which is Halsey Sr. Also, Info, Commander Task Force 77, which is Halsey's junior. Where is, repeat, where is Task Force 34 and a transmission? The world wonders. Padding, which four stars are not supposed to read. So what Halsey sees is, you know, where is, repeat, where is Task Force 34? The world wonders. And in his memoirs, he said he felt like he had been slapped in the face. He threw his cap down on deck and said something that he was ashamed to remember. He couldn't believe that his friend Chester Nimitz had insulted him this way. Now, Mick Carney, who is Halsey's chief of staff, I mean, he sees Halsey is just beside himself. He's just, you know, just, just brooding and just going on and on. So, Admiral, get a hold of yourself. What, what is this? And so he shows it to him. And then with, within a short time, they say, okay, look, Admiral, okay, this is padding. This, the, Admiral Nimitz did not send this. You know, someone in the radio shack added this. The world wonders. Oh, the, when will their glory fade? All the world wondered. And, and, and so, so, you know, so Carney is kind of calming down Halsey, but Halsey is still brooding about this. And he brews for about an hour. While New Jersey and his uh, ships are heading north at 35 knots uh, to engage the enemy. So then he says, okay, okay, turn it around. And this is what the press dubbed the Battle of Bulls Run. 
turning around, uh, you know, all, all these ships, you know, takes some time. And then, you, then once they're, they're on course, uh, you know, they, they get speed again and they have to run you know, essentially a, an extra hour to get back to, to where they were to engage. Um, Halsey chose at this time to refuel his destroyers, which slowed him down further. Uh, but it was, it was probably OBE anyway, because at this point, Admiral Kurita aboard Yamato, he sees all this American smoke. The Ameri you know, his ships are getting hit. You know, one of his cruisers has a bow blown off. Uh, American blue airplanes are buzzing around just like the day before. And he is convinced that he's engaged with Halsey and, and, and McCain and you know, the American, you know, fast carrier forces, you know, the, the first team. And not, you know, and please forgive me for all the, the gallant men who fought that day, but not the, 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 the second string beachhead mop-up guys that were in Tappy, Tappy 3. So he withdraws and brings his four. He says, you know, no more death. He didn't know what happened to the Southern force. Let's, let's, we're, we're not going to win this. Let's just go back through. So he brings his forces back through San Bernardino Strait. Um, back aboard Johnston, um, the, the ship is just during this time is just getting pummeled by the Japanese. Again, it only has one engine and can barely, uh, uh, you know, make 15 knots. Captain Evans says, OK, we have to abandon ship. And so he sends to Jardy and a sailor because uh, to uh, to to get rid of the classified material. You know, Jardy was also, you know, a collateral duty CMS custodian. So uh, good old fashioned uh, two person integrity. Uh, they go aft on the weather decks, you know, they're taking fire. So they're, they're going, they're going aft. They get rid of the classified material. They're going back to the bridge. And then Dejardi said, you know, for some reason he had to, he forgot something. He, he turned around. The other sailor continued to the bridge and then was hit and killed by a shell. That also would have killed uh, Dejardi, you know, had, had he been there too. I, it was either that shell or another one blew him off the ship. And so now he's in the water, and but Johnson, you know, coasts to a stop about 100 yards ahead, and uh, and, and finally uh, gives up the ghosts and uh, and, and sinks, and was found uh, recently. Uh, I think I believe it was last year in like 20 something thousand feet of water off Samar. Dejardi and the crew had to spend another uh, couple days in the water, and this is very reminiscent of the uh, uh, USS Indianapolis ordeal, you know. The, you know, 900 men in the water and 300 live to tell the tale. You know, as far as Johnston, I think maybe 100 men are, have now survived half the crew. And many of them lost their lives to uh, to exposure and, and sharks over the next couple of days. But before that happened, a Japanese destroyer was bearing down on them. And the men thought that they were going to be machine guns in the water. They expected it. Uh, and this is a famous uh, incident, uh, famous in naval lore. The Japanese destroyer uh, slowed and then went by with the captain and the officers in their white uniforms, all standing at attention and saluting the gallant Americans who had, who had fought so hard. One of the, one of the sailors uh, kind of thumbed their nose at him uh, at the end. And uh, I remember Ed DeJardy saying, they, uh, they, another sailor threw them a can of vegetables, canned vegetables. And, uh, and they, they looked at the, uh, uh, the can and it was made in the USA. So it, you've described that, this is the beginning of the end of the Japanese Armada, not to mention their, their Naval Air Force. So they're starting to show signs of desperation in the form of what we now know as kamikazes. And the first attack happened on the 25th of October, um, the same day as uh, all of most of the actions of the Battle of Leyte Takeoff. So talk to us about how the Americans reacted. You can imagine if you've never seen a kamikaze or never been attacked by one, the notion that a pilot would fly his airplane into your ship has got to be kind of shocking, not to mention devastating and hard to defend against. Uh, that afternoon, uh, a Japanese pilot and, and the Philippines, the uh, Japanese had, uh, had, uh, you know, quite, quite capable, you know, land-based uh, aircraft on, on Luzon. And so a, uh, Japanese aircraft carrying a bomb, uh, you know, found the Americans that afternoon, and uh, the pilot picked out a uh, escort carrier, USS Saint Lo, and uh, flew into the the fantail, and it, it ignited uh, fuel and and other fueled airplanes, and and just with uh, in a very short time, uh, Saint Lo had a massive explosion, 
and uh, and and she was lost. Amazingly, a, a sizable portion of her crew survived, but uh, that was the the first kamikaze attack. The the Americans were were surprised by this, and you know, at at the end of World War II, you know, Nimitz and and Spruance, you know, they talked about how the Pacific War was fought, and they said, you know, we the war was fought the way that we thought it was going to be fought in the 1930s when we were all planning this, you know, both sides were, were planning to fight each other. Uh, but the kamikaze was a wrinkle they had never anticipated, you know, and in our, in our Western minds, uh, we, we just can't comprehend that. That capability then with the demise of the Japanese uh, uh, Navy uh, at the end of this battle, Although it still had some ships left, but they are they are pretty much you know fed to the shredder over the next uh, nine months. Uh, the kamikaze threat was great, and uh, Okinawa kamikaze savaged the Americans, and and all the way through the end of uh, of, of the summer of 1945, um, the Americans uh, took steps to defeat it, but uh, but never really did. They were able to mitigate the threat, but that that human guidance system. You know, get, get, getting through there, it's, uh, it's tough to defend. So how did this battle end? Japan lost three battleships. It lost four carriers, including Zukaku. It's one of the, the Pearl Harbor veterans. So that was the last of the six to be put on the bottom. Cruisers and destroyers, it was really, really finished as a Navy. Uh, the Americans obviously lost some, some ships and, and uh, uh, Johnston, Hull, Samuel B. Roberts, uh, Gambier Bay. St. Lowe, there's some other awful losses. USS Princeton had been hit uh, earlier in the battle and uh, through in induced explosions, uh, you know, she was a loss. But uh, but the Americans were able to gain a toehold in the Philippines. The, the, the battle is not over. They had to fight for many, many months in the Philippines to finally take the, uh, the archipelago. But uh, Japan was was really done as a, uh, as, as a naval fighting force. But we saw that they had a lot of fight left in them and they were not gonna give up and the Americans were going to have to invade the home islands and the resistance was like nothing anyone had ever seen before. So when we talked about the Battle of Midway, we emphasized some of the serendipity, some of the, let's call it luck, that occurred with the engagements. Some of it was good dead reckoning but some of it was was luck. And we had another episode about the flight to nowhere and how you had to guess, and sometimes you guessed wrong and sometimes you guessed right. But when you think about Palawan Passage and Subian Sea, it seems like there was more deliberate action taken to engage the enemy. So had we learned a lot from Midway that we were able to leverage at Leyte Gulf? Uh, here's a lesson learned. Uh, Musashi with the absorbers, you know, 20 torpedoes. Uh, the Americans were torpedoing her from both sides. And what that did is you take a torpedo hit on the starboard side and you start to list and then you take one on the port side. And that's kind of, you know, counter flooding. It's not counter flooding that you want, but it's it's there. And which which kept it on an even keel uh, off Okinawa when the Japanese sorted Yamato on her final voyage. Uh, the Americans deliberately torpedoed her all on the same side, so to make her uh, capsize that fast. So yes, they they, they went to school, uh, as we say. Halsey had a tactical lapse, and and there's really no other way around it. And uh, and and so, uh, yeah. After the battle, Halsey went to Admiral King in Washington. He saw him and said, "Hey, I I made mistakes in that battle." And King said, "Look, Bill, don't worry about it." He retired at five stars, so he was given a fifth star. Here's what he wrote as far as the, the incident that we described as far as, uh, you know, the world wonders. Um, so so he, I, he says, I can close my eyes and see it today. From SyncPAC to Com Third Fleet, the whole world wants to know where is Task Force 34. And that's not true. That's not what was sent. That is not what he received. But that's, you know, that's what he wrote in, in his book. You know, Halsey is a flawed man and flawed men like Karita, uh, Ozawa, you know, Kincaid, Nimitz, you know, they're, 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 they're great, but they're also human. And, uh, you know, and all of their, all of them can, can be in, and even, uh, you know, Kincaid, you know, it was Kincaid's fault 
that he didn't have some of his forces that were up in a, in a patrol that they could have launched in, in the wee hours and they would have been airborne over San Bernardino Strait and given them that much more warning. So there's there's credit to, to go around and, and there's there's blame to go around too as far as the commanders. But nothing can take away the, uh, the, the valiant effort of the crews of Johnston, Hull, Samuel B. Roberts, and Herman. Commander Evans, we, we don't know uh, how he met his end. You know, did he go down with the ship? Did he succumb of his wounds in the water? We don't know that. And so it's just part of his legend. But going back to Ed DeJardy, you know, at the end of his remarks, and I'm, I'm just spellbound. I mean, we all are in, in the room like, wow, you know, this, this, this little guy here, uh, we weren't expecting much, but wow, I'm, I'm hanging on his every word. He talked about USS Herman, who again had, had gone in and, and into the teeth of Japanese fire and, and with their torpedoes and guns and Navy cross action, but they didn't go back like Johnson and Hull and Samuel B. Roberts. And, and as I'm looking at him, Mooch, I, I can see him now. That 77-year-old man became a 24-year-old man before my eyes and the fire in his eyes that uh, th- th- those guys, they went back and we stayed. And, and he's still mad, you know, 50-some years later. Well, when you think about, because you rattled off all of the big personalities, the leadership from MacArthur and Nimitz on down, these days, the war would be fought over VTC and, you know, digital message traffic. There is no padding. So what was popularly socialized as an insult would never have reached that point. So we're talking about an era where you were very much leveraged, if not over leveraged, against the judgment of those you put in positions of command and authority. And that's where these big personalities arise. And when you say Bull Halsey, I did another episode about the revolt of the admirals, which occurred in 1947, which is where that fateful year the U.S. Air Force was created, the Department of Defense was created, the CIA was created, and there was great tension, which understates it, between this brand new service called the U.S. Air Force and the United States Navy. As the new Department of Defense was pivoting from the Axis threat in the Third Reich into the threat of the Soviet Union, the space race, nuke power, so forth and so on. And the dirty tricks that were going on behind the scenes, particularly on the Navy side, were pretty remarkable. But there's this picture, because finally Congress holds a hearing and is like, let's figure this out. Let's have it out. And so the Greybeards, including Bull Halsey, because as we know, an admiral never really retires, certainly a four or five star admiral never really retires. So he's at the front of this hearing in civvies, like leaning into this line of lawmakers, telling them what's what, and it's just pure bull halsey. So that image to me is iconic in that this was the same thing that he brought to the fight in World War II. And now here's a guy with without a war anymore and without actually portfolio anymore, but he's not acting like it. I don't think we have those type of leaders anymore. And I'm not, this isn't to criticize those currently in positions of leadership. I just think the atmosphere because of technology and the way that war fighting has evolved doesn't create that, that sort of iconic, iconoclastic leadership. You know, I mean, you can say, well, there's Petraeus, and there's McChrystal, and there's, you know, these other guys that kind of emerged in the post 9-11 wars, but they didn't have the authority and the autonomy that MacArthur and Nimitz did in the Pacific Theater in World War II. So I think that's what jumps out at me about the Battle of Leyte Gulf, including how far they'd come, because we had remarked that after Pearl Harbor to Midway, which is only six months, we came a long way. And again, there was a lot of luck involved in our success there. But when you consider, then you go to Leyte Gulf and the exponential amount of learnings is a testament to how innovative and how much, how good these leaders really were. 
you know, yes, they made mistakes, but the on balance, these guys were the right guys in the right place at the right time. And and so I don't I think we should never forget that. Yeah, Mooch, I agree. That uh, you know, today there's there's instant communications and, and there's reach back uh and uh uh, in all the services, I think that the naval service, uh, the ethos is uh, okay. Go over the horizon, and, and you're you're in charge, but uh, but you are connected. Um, we can talk about the the connectivity in a future naval battle, and naval battles are very very expensive and bloody, and we don't want to see one. But if we did, you know how how would it be fought? I mean, would that that communication go away? And it probably would. Much of it would. And uh, you're going to have to uh, make a decision. And, and this is also a, a tenet of the Western way of war. And Victor Davis Hanson talks about this in, in his writings about that, that, uh, you know, our, our culture is, uh, uh, you know, we, we question our leaders. You know, we'll, we'll have a meeting with, with uh, the skipper. Hey, are, all right, skipper, are you sure we want to do this? How about this? And, and, and smart skipper is going to say, okay, yeah, I'm going to listen to you guys. Uh, where in other cultures, you wouldn't dream of, of questioning whoever is in charge. That's just, you just do whatever you're told to do. And it might be stupid, but you're not going to, you're not going to say, hey, wait a minute. Um, so, so that, that type of initiative is, uh, is valuable and it's, it's going to be needed, although we hope we never do. So, Hoser, always a pleasure to have you on the channel. I hope our paths cross in person very soon. Again, thank you for being my wingman at the air show at NAS Oceana. You saved the day. Um, as many of you know, my wife broke her wrist going into that event and she was unable to uh, be at the booth. And fortunately, Hoser was able to come up from Pensacola and, and, and help us out there. And it, it made all the difference. I couldn't have done it without you. Um, and we had a lot of fun. So we'll look forward to doing that again soon. And I want to come down to Pensacola before too long and and shoot some episodes at the museum and other places down there in, in your hood. So hopefully we can do that soon. Well, thanks a lot, Mooch. I enjoyed it. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.